few announcements to uh, your attention and uh, spring cleanup. The uh, trustees uh, decided that that's tomorrow night and it looks like it's going to be good weather. Uh, Tuesday uh, is the rain date, but God willing, it seems like tomorrow evening will be good weather at 6 o'clock. All hands on deck, uh, all ages involved. Uh, bring a few rakes and shovels and all that fun stuff and your work gloves and, of course, your mask. Uh, and uh, social, you can, you can work and do yard work. There's lots of space to show social distance. And we'll be working in the cemetery and places like that. So uh, we're just encouraging you to come out. It's always a great time. Believe it or not, spring cleanup can be a great time at the church. And so we encourage you to come out and support our trustees that do such a wonderful job on keeping our grounds and our building in good repair. Have you noticed any new, a new floor yet? Do you? You haven't been downstairs in a long time. <laughs> and so the trustees have been taking this opportunity with the board's direction to upgrade our building. And our kitchen is being upgraded. And uh, to the necessary uh, protocols that are in our day of three sinks and hand washing sink and all that fun stuff. And uh, we're getting ready. Amen. We're getting ready for what God has got for us next. So I want to say a special thank you to our trustees for that. And on that note, Wednesday evening is our annual meeting. There are no midweek programs this week. Uh, Kids Connection came to a close and some of our other midweeks. Uh, aspects on Wednesday night. We will continue the study that we're doing here on grace. You'll be able to come in on Wednesday nights. That'll be not this week, but next, and discuss what we've been discussing about on Sunday mornings uh, in this sermon series. But this Wednesday night, you've heard me verbally say it from the pulpit, part of our protocol, part of what we need to do is our annual church meeting, our AGM. We invite all of our official members to be here. You should be here. Uh, and we invite every adherent, every person who attends our church is welcome to come out to our annual meeting. It's going to be an evening of reports. And we're like, oh joy. But it's exciting. It's exciting to hear from the different ministries in our church and directions of what God's been doing this year. And especially in a pandemic. Uh, we have a lot to give God praise. So we encourage you to come out Wednesday night at 7 PM. We received a card, and this is actually part of our mission council, but of course it was sent to us as a church family, and it says, to my very thoughtful church family, uh, thanks so much. You truly have touched my heart. I am beyond grateful, and I had when I had opened your card during a very stressful time, and it has reminded me that God is always on my side, and so many people care for me. I hope this card reaches you. Thanks again, Michaela Costin. And so that's a card from Michaela. And uh, thanks to the missions for what they've been doing in reaching out to uh, some of the young people and some not so young uh, in our community. Uh, at this time, another exciting thing, uh, Margie is going to come. And who's coming with you, Margie, to help? Uh, yeah, somebody would come and help Margie with, uh, this is a response from our quilting group. They're going to come up. Yes, we could have uh, Miriam could come up too and hold up. Okay. Just, just was going to get somebody to hold up the two baby quilts and someone to help you to hold up. But I can take one corner of it. Yeah. Uh, Amanda's at the back but she doesn't want to come up. She's okay. Uh, Ruby's been a part of this. Alda's been a part of this, and uh, actually Jeannie has been a part of this. Oh, we got sideways, okay. So, Margie, you come up and just tell people the story behind this quilt, how it's come together. You gotta move it this way. Okay. Yeah, we will in a minute. We'll hold it up in a minute. Most of our material is all donated. And uh, when Jeannie's grandmother passed away, she was a great seamstress. And she brought in the material. And Jeannie's grandmother painted each block of this quilt. And she said, you can do whatever you want with it. So we put it together and quilted it. And on Tuesday, we're going to present it to the seniors' home in Kingfish. 
for participating in my uh, uh, student services. And also the other two was material brought in. Uh, I got a call from my friend that goes to another denomination and uh, she said she heard we were doing quilting and she would like to donate a box of material. So these were part of the, that we got accomplished this winter. Our season is short, our hands are few. <laughs> we have Amanda and Elda, Ruby and uh, Betty and Shirley and I worked on these quilts. Secure, Psalm 4, 9. Donated with love to the Tignish Senior Home for the Elmsdale Nazarene Ladies Quilting, April See, ladies, you can flip yours around back too. These are going to the Island Pregnancy Center. So they will be donated to the Island Pregnancy. Look, look at all the sewing in that one over there with the animals. Yeah, beautiful. You can flip them back. We're going to have a word of prayer over them. Uh, it's one thing, I know, um, I'm going to flip it that way. The ladies, the ladies group, uh, the quilting group, you know, we do this and we pass it on. Um, I know Tignish Seniors Home is very, very excited to get this quilt as we go up on Tuesday. And it's great to have a blanket, but that's not our aim. Our aim is that people will read that label. Our aim is as seniors, they said, often many seniors feel cold and they don't have an extra blanket. And that's how they're going to use this. It'll stay in the home and be used in the home and it will have the opportunity to be on different people's beds. And we're praying that they will know the love of Christ. That's our desire. Now, interesting enough, several have been done previously, and we have walked into places and have seen them on people's beds in the hospital, right? And and so, where was the other one donated? There was two donated last year. We gave two to the Western Hospital. Yeah, two were given to the uh, Western Hospital. And so we have gone in to visit people and have seen the quilt on somebody's bed next to them. And so it's quite amazing. So let's just pray. Father, we thank you today for the quilting group. We thank you. Uh, for the donations that have come in, and out of those donations, even scraps, they've been able to make something of worth and beauty. Isn't that a message of our lives, Lord, and your grace? Yes, Lord. And we pray now, Lord, that you would take these simple gifts of love and bring them to places, and the ones that have already gone out to Haiti and have already gone down to the Island Pregnancy Center. We pray for the babies and the families that will receive these baby quilts. And we pray that it will be just an opportunity for Christ to be welcomed into those homes, mm -hmm. that they would feel the love of God, and they would know that somebody cares, even sometimes in the worst situations. And we pray for Tignish Seniors Home as this blanket goes from room to room throughout the winter and at different times, that people will read the label and see the scripture and hear about the love of Christ there, that they are indeed loved by the community and more importantly loved by God. So now, Lord, we send forth these small tokens of our work and love and ask that you would use it, something as simple as this, for the furthering of your yes, kingdom Lord. in West Prince and PEI. And amen. we give you all the praise and all the glory mm -hmm. in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And amen. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Thank you for all your work. God is working in wonderful, mysterious ways. Amen? Little as much when God is in us. Would you stand to your feet this morning for our call to worship? I was thinking of Psalm 46 this morning as I read this and thought this would also be something that would speak to us for our call to worship. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, 
Though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though the waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with tumult, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city. It shall not be moved. God will help it when the morning dawns. The nations are in an uproar. The kingdoms totter. Yes, Lord. He utters his voice and the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Mm -hmm. Come, behold the works of the Lord. Yes, Lord. See what desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Lord, we see a lot of teeter-tottering going on in our world. We see nations in an uproar. Our hearts are broken for what we see around the globe. But we profess today that God is indeed our refuge. Lord, help us to know what it is to be still before you. Yes, Father. Even in this moment now, as we've come from busy weeks, many concerns, we lay our fears at your feet. We want in this moment now to enter into that place that you want us to enter into today, that Christ has paid for by his precious blood, that the curtain was torn in two, and we no longer have to be outsiders looking in, but we can enter in today because of your Holy Spirit and the sacrifice of Christ, invited by the Father. Now, God, even if people are watching online today, may they enter in. And those that will watch this even later this week, may they enter in. Yes. May we be still today and know that you are God, our God, our refuge, our source of strength. Worthy of all our praise, we give you all the praise and honor and glory today. Yes, Lord. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Amen.
Yeah. Almost no one in the book of Acts is doing what they want to do. The Spirit of God is pressing every disciple to do precisely what God wants done and not what they might envision. That's a good lesson for all of us, especially in this time and age that we're being pushed by different voices and different things that I mentioned on a Eastlink sermon a few weeks ago. I feel like I'm in a tug of war. Everybody wants my attention. Everyone's trying to pull me to their side, but I'm to stay focused on Christ. Amen. And so are you Amen. in this tug of war that we are engaged in. I pray now with the 14th century Italian author, Catherine of Siena, you, O oh eternal, the Trinity, are a deep sea into which the more I enter, the more I find, and the more I find, the more I seek. O oh, eternal Godhead, what more could you give me than yourself? You are the fire that ever burns without being consumed. You consume in your heat all the soul's self-love. You are the fire which takes away the cold, and with your light you illuminate me so that I may know all your truths. Father, forgive us, for we live in a day and age where we become less interested in the truth of the person of Jesus and more interested in power and fame and money and status and reputation and building our little kingdoms. Lord, we come to you because we know that truth is found in the person of Jesus Christ. We come today bringing all that we have and all that we are into your glorious presence, O oh Lord. Because you are the one who is the light of the world. You are the one that is the bread of life. You are the one that is the vine. And we graft ourselves into you because of what Christ has done. And Lord, you are more gracious and more, and more full of giving than we can ever imagine or grasp. And we pray, O oh Lord, that in the world that we are living in, in the midst of this tug of war, that we find people pulling us, Lord to their side or to the other side, that we will stand in the center, O oh Lord, with our eyes focused on Jesus and live our lives for the glory of God. Lord, we pray for healing. Yes. We speak Jesus, healing name, healing power yes. for the nations that are suffering right now because of COVID. We lift up India to you at this moment. Yes. Our hearts are broken, our eyes are sore, looking at film clips and news video, videos and reels, O oh Lord. A body's being cremated, reflecting an image from the Middle Ages during the time of the plague. And Lord, we pray that you would bless the leaders there, bless the doctors and the essential workers, and help them, O oh Lord, to put some dent into the escalating rise of infections and deaths and disease, Lord. We lift up Brazil, we lift up this nation of Canada, Lord. Yes. That instead of the provincial blaming the federal, the federal blaming the provincial, may we all work together for the help of the nation, oh Lord. Yes. May we learn to call upon you. And as I read that article yesterday, Lord, from Christianity Today, oh Lord, that we need to log off and know that you are God. A take on what Pastor Betty already prayed at the beginning through Psalm 46, be still and know that I am God. But in this age of constant, oh Lord, addiction to social media and the vices that we have in our hands, not that they are evil, but they can take us away from focusing on you. So Lord, it's time that we log off and be still and know that you are God. Lord, it's come to a crucial part in the church history where people know about our political slants, about what we think about certain issues rather than what we believe in the truth of Jesus Christ. We ask you for forgiveness, Lord, that we put all our energies on those peripheral things instead of focusing on you. We pray for unity, Lord. Yes. Unity in the church, unity in our families, unity in our communities, and we can deny that we're, we're united, there's nothing wrong, but Lord, our actions tell a different story. Our motivations and our reasons tell a different story. So we come to you, O Lord, to ask for forgiveness so that we may have eyes to see, ears to hear, 
and minds to conceive what you're calling us to do. As the psalmist declares, not unto me, Lord, but unto you be all glory, honor, and power. Lord, help us to understand what's going on. Help us to be grateful for the grace that finds us. And the grace, as Pastor Benny will bring forth in this Acts 10 episode, O oh Lord, of the book of Acts, this chapter, O oh Lord, that shows no favoritism. Wow. It doesn't matter what language group we come from. It doesn't matter what the color of our skin is. It doesn't matter, O oh Lord, what part of the world we come from. God shows no favoritism. Oh, and we say we want to be like God. We want to be like him. And yet, Lord, some of us are in bondage to the sin of favoritism. We've seen it raise its ugly heads in the church in Corinth. I'm a Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm a Peter. But who is of Christ? Lord, we ask for forgiveness. And not to be ashamed of it either, Lord. Because we're not where you want us to be as a living community of Christ. I'm also reminded by the words of Eugene Peterson, it's not about getting the Bible right, it's about getting it lived. Help us, Lord, to tell your story and to live your story. Lord, can you hear our prayer? For those that are still grieving and mourning because of loss and our church and in our community, in our world. For the youth that don't see a future for them. Graduate with one degree, two degrees, three degrees and still be jobless. Still seeking employment. And now it's hit Prince Edward Island as well, oh Lord. The affordability of a house. Lord, in the seven years we've been here, we've seen the change. And what? You could buy three or four houses now. You're lucky if you could buy one. But I wonder as we make money, O oh Lord, that we forget that those come behind us might not be able to afford it. So we ask for help, Lord. Help in distributing what you have entrusted with us, O oh God. So nothing can be out of our reach, O oh Lord, but we can begin to live that generosity that flows from heaven. Lord, I'm often captivated by that line in the Lord's Prayer that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that's what the Lord Jesus taught his disciples. It's not some far-fetched dream. It's not just something that happens in the sweet by and by. But you pray to the Lord with intensity that we might believe it and believe that it could take place right here in our midst, O Lord. The will of God fulfilled by the people of God. I pray for Pastor Betty Lord. As we look at sneaky grace, seeking grace, provenient grace, whatever label that we want to put upon it, Lord, and look at this glorious, mind changing chapter and what took place in the life of Peter and what took place in the life of the house of Cornelius. Give us fresh ears to hear your word, spirit wind words spoken to our whole being, O oh God. That we might have that worldview change ourselves. And not see the people coming from different lands that settle in our little communities as somebody that shouldn't be here. But seeing them as people that God has put here so that we may share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as the spirit fell upon us, the Spirit will fall upon them. O oh Lord, to see your beauty at work again in a very spontaneous way. I pray that my eyes and my ears and my life will experience afresh and anew for the glory of your Son. For I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Time we're going to have the reading of Acts chapter 10. Please. I believe there'll be an entourage coming up reading the section. So it's the whole chapter, and it is the Word of God. Amen? Amen. And my mask has to come on, I know.
us hear from the Word of God, chapter 10 of Acts. At Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day at about three in the afternoon he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? he asked. The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat, and while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened up and something like a large sheet be being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, Get up, Peter. Kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of this vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out, asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I am the one you are looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, We have come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask, to come to his house uh, so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. The next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the believers <coughs> from Joppa went along. The following day, he arrived at Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in revert in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I am only a man myself. <coughs> While talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, You are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent me for that for me? Cornelius answered, Three days ago I was in my house praying at this hour, at three in the afternoon. Suddenly a man in shining clothes stood before me. He said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused to be seen. 
he was not seen by all of the people, but the, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen. But us who ate and drank with him after he after he rose from the dead, he commanded us to preach to the people to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify and bear with him that everything who everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking the, these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the, the message. The circumstances believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, Surely no one can stand in the way of the, their being baptized with water. They had received the Holy Spirit just as we had. So he ordered that, that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. May you be challenged by the words of the Lord. Amen. Thanks be to God. Thank you. Thank you. this journey of grace, uh, discipleship as a journey of grace, uh, looking at the way, the truth, and the life, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and it's all about grace. You've heard already our passage of scripture, a long passage, but it shows us the full story, and thanks to Dave's class and all our readers this morning that helped us with that. Um, not seeing PowerPoint up there. Just the, trying to pull it up. Uh, last week, great, thanks. Uh, last week, we looked at what grace is, right? Grace is God's unmerited favor. Favor. You've done nothing to deserve grace. You've done nothing to earn grace. Remember, we said the best word for grace is what? Gift. Grace is a gift, and grace is a person. It's not a substance or a thing. Grace is a person. And we already sang about the name of Jesus, about Jesus, the presence of Jesus. And so grace is a person, Jesus. And, and so we saw that last week. And this week now we're moving on into God's sneaky grace. And now hopefully you'll understand that a little more further on. Uh, one of my favorite movies as a child, I think one of my first experiences of seeing a movie in a theater was Sleeping Beauty. And I was just amazed by this story of Sleeping Beauty. She's a princess under the enchanted spell of a wicked queen. And she is left in a perpetual state of sleep. Some of you would say amen to that. <laughs> Uh, the only way, the only way that Sleeping Beauty can be awakened and the spell broken in her life is a kiss from her prince. And his kiss will awaken her from her comatose state. Now guys, you've had a major setup, haven't you? <laughs> when you think of little girls have been raised that way to think that that's what their prince can do. Uh, but... I love this song that we heard many years ago, and this is what came to me as I was reading and preparing this week. Godfrey Bertel, quite a, quite a few years back, had a song that said, Just one touch from the king. 
Here's a few words. There's a battle raging over this land, a deep damage in the people, yet pride stops us stretching out our withered hand, yet God has stretched out to heal us. This I know, he says, this I know, and he shouts in the song, just one touch from the king changes everything. Just one touch from the king changes everything. The Bible says that human souls, because of the curse of the fall, are in spiritual death. They are in a spiritual death sleep and unable to do anything about it. They are in a spiritual comatose state. And the king of kings, the prince has come and he touches us. And that spell is broken once and for all. God makes a way for us and we are entered into a new awakening and a new reality Today we're talking about that grace that comes before, that sneaky grace. Uh, David Guzik, our, our general superintendent, who has written the book and, this, and others have written on the book, the sermon series, uh, he calls it God's seeking grace. We've used that term a lot uh, in the church. God's seeking grace that begins to come and awaken something in us. In Wesleyan theology, we call it God's prevenient grace, the grace that comes before. It is that grace that comes before, that's working in our lives. It is the grace that we see any before any human makes a decision or an endeavor. It's the love of God wooing us. It's the will of God drawing us. It's the desire of God pursuing us. It is the gift of God freeing us. It's the activity of God empowering us. We call it God's seeking grace. Prevenient grace. See, God is the one who comes seeking us first. Right from the beginning of time. That's the truth. We can only respond to God. We can only seek God because God has been seeking us. Even when we were in our mother's womb, the psalmist talks about, even then, that's why we believe in the power of a child unborn in the womb because the grace of God is even seeking the unborn in their mother's womb. Wesley believed that from birth, God's grace is active in all persons. Seeking to draw them into eternal life and relationship with Jesus Christ. And so God's grace goes before us. And because it goes before us, we call it the way. And we know his name. His name is Jesus. He is the way. And God's grace goes there to draw us into relationship with him. And today we're talking about that grace. The grace that goes before. Seeking grace, sneaky grace, prevenient grace. It is the grace that seeks us out. Do you remember where you were before Christ? I hope you do. Because it sure helps you to appreciate where you are today. Amen. See, we all have a BC, don't we? We all have a before Christ. We all have a story, uh, uh, somewhere where Christ has come in to touch us. And there are those today that are before Christ, pre-Christ. There's all kinds of terms that we use today that God's grace is already there working preveniently to draw them to himself. I hope you use your rearview mirror, and we're supposed to. I know when you do your driver's test, they always check on that. But rearview mirrors are great because they let us see where we've come from. And we want to think about that today. Where have we come from? Where has God brought us? Where has God worked in our lives? And the truth of it is, if you were to look over your shoulder, if you were to look in the rearview mirror of your life, if you are in Christ today, you can see the places where God's prevenient grace has been working in your life. The things that were said, the things that were done, the things that were read, the people that God brought across your path. Rearview mirrors are wonderful for that. I brought our fa family Bible today. Some of you came in and wondered why there were two Bibles at the front of the church. <laughs> 
And, and Pastor Mike and I were far from God. We were not uh, uh, living a life that would honor God. We didn't have a personal relationship with God. And, and But something within us said that we wanted a family Bible. And so we went into a Christian bookstore and bought a family Bible and brought that family Bible home. The Bible that you see before you. That, by the way, that family Bible has traveled with us all around the globe. <laughs> And we can, I can still see the living room. I can see the drapes. I can see the color of the wall. I can see the sofa we sat on. And, and every once in a while, for some reason, him and I would sit down and we would open the family Bible, not even knowing where to read, not even knowing what to do, even though I was raised in the church in Sunday school. And, and Pastor Mike was an altar boy in the church. And had done catechism. At that point in our lives, we were clueless. But we knew that for some reason we wanted to sit and read the Word of God. And so we sat there to read the Word of God. And then we closed the Bible real quick. And we look at each other and say, did you feel that? And, and, and we both had felt the presence of God. As we were reading God's word, we felt the presence of God with us in that moment, in that room. Something supernatural was happening, and we were kind of terrified of it, and we'd close it back up again. <laughs> what was it? That was God's seeking grace, seeking after us, giving us that opportunity to bring his word into our home and, and reading his word. And God was beginning to work on us. Page, uh, in, in a quote in the book by our general superintendent, David Buzik, he says, The Holy Spirit of God awakens person, persons to their need for salvation, convicts them of sin, and applies the atonement of Christ as they respond in faith. See, grace doesn't just begin at your moment of conversion. Grace doesn't just begin at that place of salvation. Grace was working long before you even realized it, and even before you knew it. It even was working when you were unaware of God and didn't care about God. His grace has been working. See, we don't naturally seek God. We are fallen and far from God. We don't naturally seek God, but you know what? God comes seeking for us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He comes seeking for us. And, and you know, there's a, there's a wrong theology. We, we hear it in some of our gospel songs, and we've said it ourselves, and I probably will say it again, but we'll use that term, I found Jesus. <laughs> and, and we don't realize in that statement when we make that, it's almost like Jesus is in the corner hiding somewhere, and we got to go find him, like hide and seek. The truth is, he comes running after us. He has been coming for us. And what happens is in that moment, we realize that God's seeking grace has been seeking us. And our eyes are open to see the truth. And in that moment, we respond to his grace. We say, yes, Jesus. I like what this scripture tells us. Ephesians 2, 4, and 5 says, No one comes to Christ. Christ comes to us and we respond. Listen to the scripture. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ. When we got our life all together? When we said the right words? No, Christ. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, it is by grace that you have been saved. See, the truth of it is today, all of us before Christ, pre-Christ, B.C., were all spiritually dead. Remember we said that Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. If Jesus is the life, then without Jesus we are what? Spiritually dead. And the truth is because of the fall, because of the curse, we are spiritually dead. Scripture talks about three forms of death. There is the physical death that we tend to talk about a lot, and, and we are, our minds think about a lot, but there is also spiritual death, and there is eternal death. 
And so sometimes we struggle when Jesus says, I am the life, I am the resurrection. Those who believe in me shall not die. What death is he talking about? <laughs> He's talking about that spiritual death. He's talking about, more importantly, that eternal death. You will never taste that eternal death. Oh, you'll have to go through a physical death. But you are made alive in Christ, and you will not have to experience eternal death. So scripture talks about three deaths. And so we see that the truth of it is, you could say, well, hello, pastor, I'm alive. You can pinch me, and I would say, ouch. Uh, I'm alive here today. I'm physically alive. Yes, you are. But you can be physically alive and yet spiritually dead. It, it, it is like anyone that used to watch that show, The Walking Dead. <laughs> People are going around trying to live life. It has no meaning. Oh, they're physically alive, but they haven't even yet experienced their purpose for even life itself. And they are spiritually dead, like zombies walking around. And in the midst of all that death, God's seeking grace, his provenient grace, comes to us just where we are. It's not the other way around. It's not like we go to God. God has come to us. That is why you can even respond. It's because of his wonderful grace. <laughs> See, other faiths will often say we have to go and seek the God. We have to bow down to a statue of a God. We, we have to come and bring gifts to that God, to appease that God, to please that God, to hopefully that God will do something for me and my family. Christianity is completely different. God comes seeking us. God comes seeking us. All throughout scripture, you will see God seeking us, seeking humanity. I, I was thinking about even in the garden, Adam and Eve had messed up big time. We know of the fall. We know of the original sin. And because of that sin, scripture says that they hid from God in their shame uh, chapter 3 of Genesis, verse 9 says, And the Lord called, and the Lord called to the man, Where are you? That's grace. Mm -hmm. That's God's provenient grace. God has been seeking us. God has been looking for us. And he cries out to us, Where are you? God is the first one, my friends, and all the awakenings, the conversions, the transformations, the revivals that you hear in history, it is through his Holy Spirit, he awakens our spiritual sensitivities. We are drawn to God like a moth to the flame. God is the great lover of our soul through Jesus Christ, and he is wooing people to his heart. Our passage today that we heard is about God's sneaky grace in action in Acts 10. And you can see it all throughout scripture. God calling people, wooing people to himself. This story in the book of Acts, the story of Peter and Cornelius, is the amazing turning point in the gospel in the early church. Because it is the moment when an outsider and his household are admitted into the fellowship of faith. We're told that Cornelius is a Roman centurion. The writer of Acts, Luke, is telling us important points here for us to fully understand. He's stationed in Caesarea. Caesarea was the headquarters of the government of Palestine. And the Roman army, there were legions. And those legions, there were 6,000 men. And those 6,000 men uh, were divided into 10 cohorts of 600. We have cohorts of 50. They were cohorts of 600. Those cohorts of 600 were then divided into hundreds, centuries. That means 100. And so a centurion was a man over 100 Roman soldiers. So we're told that Cornelius was a centurion. They were the backbone of the Roman army. They were the ones who would stand firm. They would die for the cause. And so we know he is a man who is courageous and loyal and steadfast. We're also told, though, this centurion is a God-fearer. So if he's a God-fearer, what it meant was his ancient ancestral faith 
of worshiping his ancestors, of worshiping many little gods the Romans would have and carry with them. Uh, even army men would carry them out to war, little gods of ancestors and different ones that they were praying to so they could pray to their gods. It means somewhere here, this centurion got frustrated with his faith as a Roman, and he had turned to the Jewish faith. When it says that he had turned to the Jewish faith, it means that he would attend a synagogue on a regular basis. It also means that as he was there, he must have come to a place where he believed in the one true God. We're told that he is a very generous man. He was giving gifts to the poor. He was compassionate and kind. And we're also told that he was a man who prayed to God. Do you realize there's a lot of people in our community today that are good people that we would consider as very similar to Cornelius? God-fearing people, we say. God-fearing people. You know, it's almost like Cornelius is like a child looking through a piece of glass as he has his face pushed up against it while he's watching all the insiders uh, enjoying a great meal. And he's just the outsider looking in. But what's beautiful in this passage today is God had a different plan for Cornelius. And God has a different plan for those that are feeling like outsiders, just out standing outside and looking in. Now we know that our passage about Peter, don't we? Peter was that disciple that Jesus called and said, you're going to be a rock, Peter. That's what actually Peter means, Petra, rock. And, and, and so we know that he's the one who denied the Lord three times, and he is outside again of the faith. And Jesus decides to have the first men's breakfast, and Peter now is invited to eat with the Lord, and they take that nice long walk together, and he's reinstated. And so Peter sees and receives this great commissioning. He sees the Lord ascended and taken up, and now he's the one who received the Holy Spirit and he preached that great sermon on the day of Pentecost. And thousands, can you imagine preaching your first sermon? Can you imagine Bracton preaching your first sermon? Or Pastor Sheila, Pastor, preaching your first sermon. Thousands were added to the church in one day. Wow. You know, that's amazing. This is Peter. Guess what? Peter needed to learn an important lesson before God could use him as a minister is it possible today that no matter how many years you've walked with the Lord, no matter what has happened in your life, no matter all the great things, even filled with the Holy Spirit, sanctified, set apart for God, that God just might want to teach you something today? <laughs> See, there had to be a shift in Peter's thinking. God in his grace was also working in Peter's heart and life. See, Peter had come from a rigid religious upbringing, and he was taught that God has no use for Gentiles. God has no place. They're the scum of the earth. And those Romans, they're the enemy. They're not welcome. They're not to be trusted. Often you'll hear the church say, those people. <laughs> and in our passage, God's grace was already working in Peter's life. How do we know that? The book of Acts tells us that he was meeting at Simon, living at Simon the Tanner's house. Why is that significant? Simon the Tanner would have had to live outside the town, and that's where Peter has gone. Many believe that Simon the Tanner was probably someone who had come to faith. Why is this significant? A tanner was dealing with dead bodies and carcasses all day long, and as they did that, that made them ceremonially unclean. So no good upstanding Jew would ever stay with Simon the Tanner. And yet this is where we see Peter. God is already working in Peter's heart and life as he stays with Simon the Tanner in Joppa. Interesting enough, the homes were very small in those days, and if you wanted any privacy, you went up to the roof. And so Peter goes up to the roof to have this time of prayer with the Lord. But surprisingly to Peter, uh, this vision comes to him, and this sail comes down, and three times it comes down, and it is filled with all kinds of animals. Animals that the rigid, religious Jew, who had strict food uh, directions, would never eat. Praise God, lobster was probably there. <laughs> Hallelujah, and crab too. <laughs> and no, no Jew would ever eat that.
that stuff. And so the Lord says, go and eat it. <laughs> Peter, have a feast. And Peter is like, oh, no, Lord, I've never touched anything on clean and ate that kind of stuff. And as Pastor Mike said, God says to him very powerfully, do not call anything impure that God has made clean, Peter. Three times he has to hear it. We realize that God shows no favoritism, no partiality. Peter had to learn this lesson just before Cornelius' men come knocking at the door. And so we heard that scripture read there in verse 23. And so Cornelius' men, it's interesting, Peter does something amazing. God starts to break down the divisions because we're told in that situation these Roman men, Cornelius' men that have been sent, Peter now welcomes them into the house and they stay there with Peter. Unheard of. Absolutely unheard of that a Jew would welcome Romans <laughs> to come and feast at his table and stay with him. And we see that God is already working in Peter's life to tear down those divisive barriers Peter is invited then into Cornelius' home. Peter's knocking at Cornelius' door. And we see once again another barrier being broken. So it's not just this Jew welcoming into his home, but now this upstanding Jew needs to walk into a Roman home. And another barrier is being torn down. And so in the midst of all of this, we see God's provenient grace working behind the scenes in Peter's life, in Cornelius' life, in his family, it says, close family and friends' life, as they gather to hear what Peter has to say. You want to see how God is working in this passage? How does God work today in people's lives? You'll see crossroads. What do we mean by that? You ever feel you've been in a crossroad in life? Uh, we call it midlife crisis. <laughs> Doesn't have to happen at midlife. The pandemic and COVID has brought a crisis or a crossroad. There is that place where you know that you're tired the way it is. Like we talked about uh, Cornelius giving up his gods and becoming a God-fearer. That would be a crossroad. Then there's a place in our life when there's a holy dissatisfaction with life as the way we know it. And we are at a crossroad to make a decision. That is God's provenient grace working on you and your heart and life. Then we see curiosity. We, we see that, that, that Cornelius went to search and seek. The angel comes to him and gives him this vision to go and get this Peter. And he gathers his close relatives and, and his uh, closest friends to hear what this Peter has to say. God is using curiosity. God used curiosity for us as we sat down to read God's word. There is something that God is beginning to do. That's God's provenient grace. When people start to want to know more, when people start to ask questions about the faith, when people hang around longer than they normally used to because they want to hear more and they want to dive in more and study more, then companionship. We know already God has been working Cornelius' life because he had been circling himself with other godly people. He's watching faith lived out. He's hearing the word of God in the synagogue. We believe, many believe, that there were already Christian believers in that synagogue probably praying for Cornelius to come to faith. And so in companionship, the goodness of what's happening in other people's lives are beginning to rub off on him, and he's desiring more of God. And so he's praying for God to show up, and God shows up in that companionship. You know, right around the time we were reading the Bible and feeling the presence of the Holy Spirit, we had somebody knock at our door. Mel and Maud. Mel and Maud were two individuals from our parents' church at the time, my home church. They were not boyfriend, girlfriend. They were just two Christian friends who heard my parents pray for Betty and Mike. And in the midst of hearing <clears throat> them pray for Betty and Mike, they felt the Holy Spirit say to them, you need to travel half an hour up to Brampton, go get their address, and go knock on their door and introduce yourselves, and leave it with me. 
And so we were at a night, it happened to be a night we were home, we were just probably a night after we had been partying, <laughs> and we'll leave that at that, what that looked like. And uh, they knocked on our door, complete strangers. And of course, like any good Canadian, you welcome them in. And we welcomed them in, looked at each other like, what's this about, and sat down and had coffee with them, and God began a friendship with Mal and Mott, a companionship, a walking alongside of us in our curiosity and companions with us that lived out faith before us and tried their best to answer our questions. But more importantly than anything else, they were honest and real and cared, and I know they prayed for us. We are where we are today because of the companionship of Mel and Mott. And then conviction. Because of all of that going on, because they came knocking at our door, the Holy Spirit began to knock at our heart's door. And in verse 34 and 40 through 43, Peter shares this wonderful truth of the gospel and this large gathering. In verse 44, we are told that Peter was still speaking when the Holy Spirit fell on them. And they heard the message. Conviction is the grace that begins to align our lives to the kingdom of God even before we are part of the kingdom. It is that work that God is doing. And so we are on this journey as uh, discipleship, as a journey of grace. And I want to tell you today, my friends, we need to understand that it doesn't just start at conversion. It starts way back there as we look back and see God ministering and working in our hearts and lives. That's where the journey began. God making a way for us. God's unmerited favor when we didn't deserve it. When we were living lives that were ungodly, God came seeking us, looking for us. God is the one through his spirit that draws us. I like what Pastor Sheila said a few weeks ago. It is us who witness and God the Holy Spirit convicts. No one, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up on the last day. So in our passage today, we see God's provenient grace at work. We see it working in Cornelius' life. We see it working in that gathering of friends and neighbors and family. But we also see God's provenient grace working where? In Peter's heart and life. Peter needed to think differently, have a transformation in order for God to use him as a minister of grace. You know, we sang that song, I want to speak the name of Jesus over people's lives. Where is God working today? Where are people that are B.C.? pre-Christ, before Christ, that God is working. Maybe you're a person in the church today that you would say, I'm before Christ, I'm a God-fearer, and, and things have been drawing me, and I didn't fully understand what it was. I've been feeling his presence at times when we worship. I see other people excited, and I don't understand it all. And that is God's provenient grace working in your life, drawing you to not me or this church, drawing you to him. We have to ask ourselves, as the Church of Jesus Christ, where is God working in the lives of others outside this church? Who are those that are B.C., the provenient grace has been working? You see, because in the reality of that, God calls us then to come alongside them, and we'll see the change and transformation that needs to happen in their lives, because God is working. I believe with everything within me, God is working. But in order for God to work through us, what shift needs to happen in our thinking? What shift needs to happen in your thinking? Uh, I was thinking often in the church, and pastors have a heavy load to carry. It's all put on our shoulders, because if people are going to come knocking on the door, if people are going to walk alongside people, if people are going to see people say, the church usually thinks that's the pastor's role. Wrong. That needs a shift that needs to happen. 
Because Ephesians tells us that the pastor's role is to equip the, work, equip the saints for the work of ministry. I can't go knocking on the doors that you can go. I don't know the people and their situation like you know. Oh, I can be in a church, I can pray, I can witness, I can do what God's calling me to do as a pastor. But ultimately, only you can be used by God in the sphere of influence that you have. And sometimes there's a shift in our thinking that needs to make that a reality. Could that be what God is wanting to do today? Maybe God needs to shift our thinking. God admonished Peter, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. Judgments? Attitudes? Is there things that God is needing to work in our lives and change? As I bring this to a close and the worship team comes, this passage ends with a great celebration. I love that it ends with a great celebration. They come to faith, and there is a church birth. Can you imagine? So many people are gathered now in Cornelius' home, and the Spirit falls on them, and we see the gifts of the Spirit being there, and all of a sudden, they're going through the waters of baptism, not just one or two, but the whole household, the friends, the relatives, everyone is got saved at the same time, and they all go through the waters of baptism together. And there is this great celebration with Peter and the other uh, believers that followed. We're told that some other believers followed Peter and Cornelius and this unity and this blessing that God is doing there. And so this discipleship as a journey of grace has begun for Cornelius and that group. And they ask Peter to stay so that he can instruct them and disciple them in the faith. And so it's a beautiful picture. Praise God today for his provenient grace. Praise God for his grace that has gone before. Maybe today your homework is to go home and look in the rear view mirror. And look at all those places in your life. That Sunday school teacher that prayed for you. That person in the church that was a witness to you and showed what godliness was like. That person in the community. That person who witnessed to you and shared the good news. Where has God's grace been working in your life? Where did it work in your life before Christ? You need to give God thanks today and praise for that. Because you are where you are today because of that provenient grace. You are where you are today because God has been seeking you and wooing you with this wonderful love. Like a moth is drawn to a flame, God's love has been drawing you to himself today. Now ultimately... Cornelius made the right choice. God's grace was working in Cornelius' life and all those gathered, but he had a choice that day. He had to respond to God's grace. Like we all who have come to faith, we've said yes to Jesus. Cornelius and that crowd said yes to Peter and the message and ultimately yes to Jesus. But we also can reject God's grace. I, I pray today that you are one that has accepted God's grace and will not reject it. Some of you today would say, Pastor, it's time for me to pledge my allegiance. I woke a few up to Christ. See, Cornelius pledged his allegiance to Rome. He had to come to a place where he pledged his allegiance to Christ. Have you pledged allegiance to Christ? Do you know how we pledge allegiance to Christ? We show that through the waters of baptism. I no longer live, but Christ now lives in me. I die with Christ in the waters and come alive in Christ. That is my, my symbol of pledging my allegiance to Christ. And I know there's one person and possibly a second who's been wanting to be baptized. And I think time is coming that it's time to have a baptismal service in the Elmsdale Church of the Nazarene. COVID or no COVID. We'll find a way to make it happen. Maybe you're going to be obedient to God today and you're going to say, Pastor, I'd like to be baptized. I'd like to learn more about it. Maybe like Peter, we're going to allow God to do a deeper work in us. That we can become ministers of his grace in a time like this. Many of you know this song. 
Corey Asbury, we're not going to sing it, but a lot of people have had issues with it because, see, there's this idea of God's divine appointments are waiting for all of us, and God is doing what he needs to do to, to come to us, and we sing that wonderful song, The Reckless Love of God. Now, a lot of people don't like the word reckless because they don't like that given to God, but I can understand Corey's heart because it seems so reckless because it doesn't make sense because I'm such a sinner and I'm so far from God. Why would he come running after me? Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. And I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. There's no shadow you won't light up. Mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. That's God's sneaking grace. Praise God today for his sneaky grace that didn't give up on me, that didn't give up on you, and will not give up on those that we are praying for, and those that God is going to send us forth to go knocking on doors and being God's instruments of grace. Father, we come today now. We ask and surrender this service to your glory as we did at the beginning. In this moment of this closing song, would you come and move and speak to people as only you can? This is a house of your grace. And we give you permission to do business with us today. Do you need to shift our thinking today, Lord? Amen to it. Do we need to allow you to come in and not reject your grace and respond and say, Amen, yes, Jesus, I love you. Yes, Jesus, I want to serve you. Yes, Jesus, I proclaim you are my King and my Lord and my Savior. And some of us, Lord, need to be obedient to your voice and say, I pledge allegiance to the Lamb, and it's time that I go through the waters of baptism, just like Cornelius and his whole household. Speak to us today, Spirit, as you would speak, and we leave the rest with you. Yes, Lord. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. Stand with us as we sing about God's glorious hope.